Amen. All right. Thank you for having me back from Jacksonville. <clears throat> I was worried I was stuck there, but there's a beach, there's sun, there's good people there. So if you guys are looking for a vacation, come check out Steadfast Jacksonville. You'd love it. Amen. And I'm really encouraged by the growth here. I mean, you guys, it's just new faces. Like I said, some good looking faces. I guess all the ugly guys, they're in the Philippines, right? So, <laughs> you tell them I said so when they get back. It's good that you guys are able to do those sort of things. I saw your small, small town soul winning and the, the Apache reservation. I mean, it's exciting to see all the things that God is doing with Steadfast, not just here, but there, and everything that we have planned. And there's new things happening, but you know, that there's new opportunities, there's new responsibilities. And you know, there's a chance for you to serve somewhere. And I, I'm encouraged by seeing the growth that's here. I just want to give you an update. In Jacksonville, just this last week, we actually went past our 1,000 people saved since the beginning of the church. Amen. That's awesome. In Jacksonville, we're, we're averaging around 80 to 90 people on a Sunday morning. We've got up to 20 men that'll preach on a men's preaching night. We've got 40 soul winners on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, the Lord is just blessing more and more and more what's happening in Florida. There's some good folks over there. There's people that are hungry for the word, and I'm thankful to be part of it, and I'm thankful for the support you guys have given us. Awesome. Look, we're in Psalm chapter 12. I want to encourage you to be faithful in all things. Look at verse number one. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Notice how he starts out. He says, help. All right, this is a cry for help, and he says that the faithful fail. And what I want to talk about this morning is failures of the faith. There are men throughout the Bible that have absolutely failed at their job of being a man of God. There are men that started off great, and they fell on their face, they got lazy, they went back to the world, they, they stopped doing the important things, and they became a total failure. Their name becomes a byword in history. And yet there are men in history of the Bible where we see men that fall, that fail, and yet they get back up. You know, in Proverbs it says, A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. And I want to encourage you as you go through life, as you get closer and closer to God's will, as you get in this battle for souls, you're going to have failures. You're going to have times where you're going to find yourself falling. You're going to have times where you're discouraged by your surroundings or your family just things that are going on that you don't know how to answer. And listen, don't take a failure as a final failure. When there are good men in the Bible that failed miserably, but it was recoverable. And they went on fighting. They did many more wonderful things after they failed, and they learned from their failure. But we're going to look at a few guys that just totally flat out, you look at them today in, in retrospect in the Bible, and they're a failure of the faith. And I don't just want to emphasize on the negative. We're going to look at the positive outcomes and, and how you guys can apply this to your life. And look at verse number two. He says, They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Well, who's the they that it's talking about here? It says the faithful fail from among the children of men, right? The godly man ceaseth. There were men of God, there were faithful Christians, that all of a sudden they are the ones that with a double heart. They are the ones speaking about vanity. Vanity means worthless, hollow, empty, unimportant. You know, oh, did you hear about the cowboys? You know, oh, what, well, what, kind of, what, how, what color are you painting your house? Hey, what about ghost soul winning? What about what scriptures have you read recently? Tell me your soul winning story. Don't tell me about the things of the world. Don't tell me about some stinking TV show. Yeah. And there are many Christians today that have just totally bombed and that's where they're at. They want to talk about TV. They want to talk about news. Oh, did you hear what's happening? It's, it's the same thing from a decade ago. Yeah. So what? Yeah. God's still in control. Amen. Right? Amen. Yeah, there's conspiracies out there. There's a conspiracy reality. The devil has conspired to take the Bible out of our culture, yeah. out of our schools, right. even out of our churches, and right. he's been successful. And Christians have failed at standing up and preserving the Word of God. Amen. And what's the result? What happens when the man of God stops being faithful, when he starts speaking vanity? Look at verse number 8. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. You look at the vile people we have in our government today, Yep. And you wonder why you're surrounded by a bunch of weirdos and perverts. 
Because what they're teaching, what they want to be normal, how th what they want your children to do, is just goes against God's word. Yeah. Why? Because the faithful have failed. Right. The men of God that should have taken a stand, the ladies, the moms, quit teaching God's word to their children. They just left it up to Sunday school. And listen, we can fix this. We need to encourage our generation to not be a bunch of stinking failures. Amen. We need to wake the people up. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. The Bible warns us that in the end times, that there will be a famine of the word. There will be a famine of churches actually preaching the word of God. It also talks about a great falling away. That there will be many people that fall away from Christianity. And of course, they're not really Christians. Right? These mega churches are not of God. They're not Christians. They got the wrong gospel, the wrong Bible, yeah. the wrong spirit. And it's no wonder, it's no marvel when the Antichrist stands up that they say, oh, I like your, oh, I like your message. That tickles my ear. Right? It's no wonder that they fall away because they never were with us. Yeah. Right? It, it makes sense. And this is the symptoms of the end times. And it's happening around us. Our country is damned if we don't do something about it. Our country, our state, is doomed if we don't speak up and preach the word of God. Our country is under a curse by God. Amen. And listen, we're looking in Revelation here. We're going to look at these warnings that were given to the churches. There are several churches, and you could say there's good and bad about both, but what I just simply want to look at is the warning that were given to the churches, and if we pay attention to it, it will help us to preserve the faithfulness of our own self, but also of the people in our church. Hey, we're called to fellowship together. We're called to encourage each other, to lift each other up. And I want you to take heed to the things that we read this morning and don't let these things slip. You need to be faithful in all things. And look at how relevant in the end times, what we have is the warnings here in Revelation to these churches. You're going to see it's the same problems we're having today. It's the same exact problems that the churches are under attack by a bunch of false prophets, a bunch of fake Christians, and we need to stand up and say something about it. Yeah. Hey, but the flip side of that coin is we need to stand up and speak the truth. Right. Right? Right. We're not just here to call out false prophets. We're here to speak the truth. Amen. You can't expose the error without showing what the truth is. Yeah. And there are many Christians that have that wrong. So this warning to these churches is a current problem. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse number 2. This is written to Ephesus. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And listen to this. And hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. He's warning that there are false prophets coming into the church. And he's saying this church did a good job because they checked them out. They made sure they were actually saved. They're trying to find, oh, you're an apostle. Oh, really? And they start checking their doctrine to find out. Listen, we had a problem in Jacksonville. And if, if we failed to check this guy's salvation at the door. Oh, well, I'm an online listener. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a hearer, right? He's a hearer only is what it was. Oh, I'm a hearer of the word. Oh, are you a doer? Well, I want to go so on it. I want to learn, right? And we had problems down the road because we dropped the ball. We failed to check his salvation. We failed to make sure. And listen, as a new believer, if you're a visitor today, don't get offended if somebody comes to you after the service and make sure that you know for sure you're going to heaven. Don't take it personal. It's our job. This is our responsibility. Yeah, yeah. God has commanded us to preach the gospel. And it, woe unto me if I don't do it. Yeah. Woe unto us if we don't make sure you know about the free gift of everlasting life. Amen. That is our responsibility. And we had a problem because we failed to do that. It caused a problem down the road. But here he's, he's, God is admonishing them and bragging on this church because they were false apostles. And they found out. They exposed them. False prophets have been coming to this church to try to attack the pastor or the doctrine since the very beginning. Amen. Since this church started in Pastor Romero's house. The first time that I visited, there was a guy there that turned out later we found out he was a major false prophet. Yep. But he brought two false prophets with him. And for those of you that, that have seen those old sermons, that's back when Pastor Romero had a mustache and back then I didn't you know a lot has changed since then but what has not changed is the steadfastness of finding out what is right what is wrong preaching the truth and exposing the heretics that is something that churches have failed to do and therefore they're falling away they're compromising they're turning into liberal fund centers you might as well call it a country club when you're more oh you want to join the church fill out the application we need to see your, your checkbook we're going to go ahead and write your tithing check and we want to do a background check and Here's your gym passes. It's, I mean, that's a country club. That is not a house of God. Amen. And that's what we're surrounded by. Look at verse 3. He says, 
and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, hast labored and hast not fainted. There's many of you in here that have not fainted, and I'm encouraged by that. I'm bragging on you because of that. I'm here and I see some of the same old faces from the beginning. You guys haven't fainted. Man, praise the Lord. Stay faithful. Don't fail at what God has given you to do. Look at verse number four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. This is the church that's gone the way of invitation only. All we're going to do is go out and pass out invitations. We don't want to offend anybody with the gospel. Well, excuse me, that's your job. It's your responsibility to preach the gospel. And you think, well, what is that first love? It says that Andrew, when he found Jesus, he first went straight away and found Peter, his brother. Right? The first thing he did, he went and got his brother. He, what he, would, he knew the truth when he found it. He's like, man, i got to tell others. He had that zeal and that excitement. And I encourage you that have been here for years that have been soul winning, don't lose that zeal. Amen. Don't fail from your faithfulness of being a soul winner, always being excited, looking with spiritual eyes for people you can preach to. That's our job. And look, they were failing at it. This visitation only church. Look at verse number five. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. When he says remove thy candlestick, he's talking about removing the church. You ever wonder why all these, well, I mean, in, in Jacksonville, there's this one church in particular, and I mean, their signs are like, we love football. Literally, we love this football team. We and it's like, what in the world does that have to do with church? Yeah. And somebody told me, oh yeah, that used to be a Baptist church. They built this monstrosity. It was a Baptist church, but what happened? They didn't do the first works. They, didn't, they lost their first love. So God said, okay, I'm going to take your candlestick away, and I don't care. They can turn this building into a country club because it's not a church. Yeah, we need to make sure that doesn't happen. Look what he says in verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God is praising the church for their hate. Wait a minute, is that what it says? Let's read it. Wait. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. God says, I hate these false prophets, and I'm bragging on you because you hate these false prophets. You're not just going to let, everybody's welcome, false prophets include. No, we hate them. We hate Amen. their doctrine. Right. They're not Amen. welcome here. Amen. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Yes, that's our job. We're supposed to. You know, he says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. You're supposed to hate. If you, if you say, well, I, I just don't hate anything. I would say you need to check yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This church had a great name for their first love, and they lost their first love. The same church that was known for their love was known for their hate. I think there's a balance in all things. And, and they, they were good at getting the false prophets out, but they began to fail at preaching the gospel. And they lost their first love. And we don't need to do that. We need to remember that because we hate the evil, we love the good. We go out preaching to get people saved. We go out preaching to preserve souls. And remember what it said, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest of men are exalted. That's the devil's goal. The devil's goal is to get a bunch of vile people, a bunch of perverts in every aspect of your life. Whether it's the gas station or city hall or, or the, the White House, he wants to be surrounded by vile men. And then he can begin to be successful at destroying this nation. Look at verse number 9. We're looking at Smyrna now. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich and i know the blasphemy of them that say they are jews and are not but are of the synagogue of satan there's a warning here about fake jews look again false prophets coming into the church and he's saying hey good job you caught them you didn't let them in you didn't let them reign you didn't let them take over and wreck your church look at verse 14 to pergamus he says but i have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. He's warning about this church. And, you know, there's an end time parallel. All these other fake churches out there, they have the doctrine of Balaam. Yep. They're not upholding the gospel. They allow fornication in their church. And that is wicked as hell. That's right. And listen, 
Fornicators should be kicked out of the church. Amen. That's what God says. And he also, if you defile your body, God will destroy your temple. Your body is the temple of God. You want to, you want to see somebody lose their health real quick? Yep, yep. Be in the will of God, then start fornicating. Just right. watch God destroy your life. Watch how God will right. curse your life. Amen. Yeah. And look, thank, look at verse 15. It says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now here in Revelation chapter 2, twice God says, I hate this. Twice he warns them, I hate this. Now the other church, he praised them because they hated this false doctrine also. This church, though, he's warning. Like, whoa, you're letting fornication in. What is this Nicolai? I mean, what is it? Is it you let, you let the homos in? You let this doctrine of Balaam in? You let fornication in? You let some leaven in? You let the world in? You just let anybody be in control? God's going to destroy this church because of their unfaithfulness. They're becoming failures because they're not standing up. They're not hating as God hates. Amen. Amen. Hey, you know, when I was a kid, they used to have this campaign. It was true love waits. Talking about that you shouldn't, you know, engage in, in, in marital relationship before you're married. And that was a good thing. But how about true love hates? Amen. How about true love hates? If you love the children of God, you should hate the children of the devil. Amen. You should hate this doctrine of Balaam. You should hate fornication in the church because it will destroy your church. You should do everything to prevent against it. Let's look at Thyatira, verse number 20. And then he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Here you have a church that has allowed a rebellious woman to subvert the authority structure that God has set in place. And what happens? Fornication. What happens? The church is destroyed. That's not how God wants it. Look at Sardis, chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. Again, God is warning, I'm going to destroy your church because your works are not perfect. Look at verse number 9 with Philadelphia. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Again, you have these fake Jews. Back in Jesus' time, Judaism was hijacked by the Pharisees, by their oral tradition. Today, if you say the word Jew, people think you're talking about a race, and sometimes that applies. But really, it's talking about the religion that studies the Babylonian Talmud. The mystery religion that the Antichrist will practice, that Freemasonry is based on, the Illuminati, all of these occults go back to this same thing. The same mystery religion, the same wickedness that you find in Babylon and Egypt and in the world. And he was warning this church, don't let it come into your church. You should stand against it. Look at the Laodiceans in chapter in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth the lukewarm church who wants to be known as that man talk about a dud in god's eyes you're not good you're not you're just like right staying in the middle line you won't do anything over you know turn to second kings chapter 10 second kings chapter 10 so to prevent church failure you have to be hot you got to be on fire for god you got to maintain that zeal that you had of doing the first works of having the first love for the souls you have to expose false prophets. You have to keep fornication out of the church. We see those examples just briefly in these end times churches that I believe it has a direct correlation with where Christianity is in America today. It's a sad state where Christianity is. The next guy we're going to look at is Jehu. You're in 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10, look at verse number 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted upon Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, 
coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? So he salutes the guy. He says, Hey, is your heart right? Do you have a right heart with God? Look what he says. And Jehonadab answered, It is. So how does Jehu reply back? He says, If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand. And he took him up into his chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in the chariot. So here, what is having a right heart before God? It's having zeal for the Lord. Right? It's not lukewarm. It's being on fire. It's being excited. It's when, when, when church just becomes plain old boring church, it's still having some excitement and thanking God for the blessings that you do have. Thanking Amen. God Amen. for the things, the triumphs, and the victories that he's gotten you through. It's still maintaining your zeal. Look what he says in verse 17. And when he came to Smyrna, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal and all his servants and all his priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. So Jehu puts out this proclamation. Right? He's taking over the kingdom. He says, if you want to live, if you serve Baal, you better come now. I'm going to kill you if you don't show up. Notice he actually gives him a death threat. right? But it says he's doing it with subtlety. He has a plan. He has an idea here. And it's to clean house. It's to clean up the nation. It's to free Israel from the bondage that they're in. And that's a great start. You know, he's hating the things that God hates. He's destroying those that hate God. Look at verse 25 in the same chapter. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end to offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard on the captains, Go in and slay them. Let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains cast them out and went into the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. You know what a draft house, Jesus talked about that whatever enters into the mouth goes through the belly and comes out the draft. Right? When he says he made the house of Baal like a draft house, that's like a dunghill. It's a pile of crap. He says, that's what I think of these false gods. They need to be destroyed. You want somewhere to dump your trash? Come put it right here on, the, on what used to be the house of Baal. And with a victory like this, I mean, he's really starting things off great. Jehu is zealous. He's on fire for God. He's changing things. Look what happens next. Look at verse 28. Thus, Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. This is a great victory. This is a great time for Israel. Like, it's like they're beginning to have some light in their nation. But Jehu, it turns out, was a failure. Jehu, I mean, this saying, come and see my zeal for the Lord, is one of my favorite sayings in the Bible. But yet, what happened to his zeal? Jehu was not faithful. Jehu lost his zeal. Jehu went back to the world. He went back to the old ways. He quit fighting the fights that he was commanded by God to fight. And he failed, and it hurt the whole nation. You know, and it says, but with flattering lips and a double heart, do they speak? Remember he said, is your heart right with my heart? Remember he had that zealous heart. But look at verse 29. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from them. Wait, what? Are you kidding me? This guy was on fire. He's killing the enemies of God. He's destroying the enemies of Israel. He's setting people free. He's changing things, but then he goes back to the old sins of this other guy. It's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm finally, I'm going to church, and I've started going soul winning, but there's this show on, football's coming, I'm going to stay home and watch TV, right? Well, I mean, just one little drink won't take me out of being a Christian. It won't take me from serving the Lord. Just a little bit of drugs isn't that bad. I just need it, right? And what happened is, he went back to the fleshly ways, he went back to evil ways, and it affects the whole country. Look, he says, Jehu departed not after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well, 
in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So he was zealous. His heart was right with God. But look at the next verse. Look at verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So when, he, when it says that he didn't take heed to walk in the law, basically it's saying he made them to sin also. Instead of stopping the sin, he walked in the flesh just like them. He went back to these old ways. He wasn't obeying the commandments of God. You know, oh, we got rid of Baal, but we'll just leave Moloch. We'll let Moloch stay around a little bit. Can you imagine? I mean, what a stinking failure. This guy had great things going. He had the whole country excited, and then he just stops. He just takes a break. He just, I'm done. I did my work. I'm good to go, right? But that's not God's plan. Look, he said, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Why didn't he get rid of the rest of the wicked men? Because he could have preserved the country. Look at, look at verse 32. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Hazel smote them in all the coast of Israel. He could have prevented that. People died because he wouldn't walk in God's law. And sin is like that in our personal life. A lot of times we get excited, we get on fire, we start changing things, we're moving forward, but then we compromise. Well, yeah, but that's that one thing. Not, not the golden calf. Come on, God, I, I like my golden calf. Don't talk about my TV. i got to have it. You don't understand. That's my show, right? God hates these things. Amen. I mean, you, the generations before sinned and caused our generation to sin. It's our chance to turn it around and change things. But we have to continue to walk in God's law. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 13. Jehu was a great guy to start with, but he turns out to be a loser that didn't finish the work. He was a loser. How sad is that? How would you like to go down in history? How would you like to stand before God and he say, well, you did a good job for a few years, but, but you dropped the ball. You missed an opportunity. You went back to the ways of Moloch instead of moving forward. I had a great thing for you. I had a great ministry for you. I had great blessings for you. And you went back to the world. You went back to your old ways. Jesus said, no man having put his, putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. God wants you to remember, when you get your hands on that plow, keep moving forward. Yeah. Don't let anybody Amen. take you off that. God has great things for you and great blessings. And the only way the devil can curse you is to get you to choose to walk away from your own blessing. God's got a hedge of protection around you. You know, I, I used to live in another state, and there was this soul winner I used to go out with, Rick. And Rick and I would go soul winning a lot at off times and off hours. He'd call, hey, I'm, I got a few hours. You want to go out real quick? And this guy was very talented. Rick was blessed of the Lord in probably every aspect of his life. He was, he was a smart guy. He was sharp in his soul winning presentation. The Lord talented his hands with just about everything that he did. He blessed him. He had many rewards. He's got many rewards in heaven. And, you know, when the Bible talks about that there are some that bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100, Rick was a 100 guy. Rick was a hundred, he could get a hundred people saved in a year just by going soul winning a couple times a week. And the devil knew this. And the devil was trying to find Rick's price. And he finally did. Well, if we can just increase your business a little bit more, and all you have to do is take off Sunday, then there you go. You have all the fine, you can go build your big house. You can go do all these things that you were never able to do before. And it's really sad because Rick is one of those guys that if you met him now, you'd be like, man, this guy's sharp. Man, this guy, well, I mean, he has got great potential. He would get you excited, but yet he's not doing the first works. He's lost his first love. And you think about it, for the next 20 years, if Rick doesn't change his mind and change his course, that's potentially 2,000 people that the devil is trying to keep out of heaven. And yeah. you consider this, hey, what if you say, well, well, I'm only a 30 a year kind of guy. Or I'm, I'm just 10 a year. I'm new. I'm not that good. That's okay. 10 a year is better than zero. This, I don't care how talented you are, how blessed you are, what you've got going for you. I don't care how good looking you are, or smart or well spoken. If you're not doing the basic things, you're a stinking loser. You're a deadbeat Christian. And this guy, if he don't turn it around, thousands of people 
potentially could be saved if he would just change his heart. And it's the devil got him. The devil found his price. We all have a price. What is it? Don't let the things of this world, don't let the flesh take you out of the fight. Yeah, but, but you don't understand. I got a special situation. I don't care what it is. The devil's trying to find your price. Yeah, he's right. trying to hang that carrot in front of your nose and get you to stop being a soul winner and stop serving. Oh, but I was going through a famine. I got no. God will provide during the famine. Amen. Don't leave the plow. Don't leave your your course. Don't be a loser. Amen. Look, you're in First Kings 13. We're going to look at another failure of the faith. A guy that didn't finish the job. He didn't obey the instructions of the Lord. He knew what he had to do. In fact, this guy comes in to do a mighty thing. He has miracles. He does some amazing miracle here that God does through him. But he's such a failure that God did not put his name in the Bible. God, said, God, God wants us to learn from this. Like, I mean, this guy worked miracles and preached hard against the king, what other prophets would not do. But yet he failed to finish. Therefore, God did not put his name in the Bible. He doesn't want us to say, oh, this guy. No, he's unnamed. Man, when we get to heaven and meet this guy, oh, you're the unnamed prophet. Oh, that's you. I mean, come on, think about it. Who wants to be known as a failure? Look at 1 Kings chapter uh, 13, verse number 7. After preaching to the king, he says, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me the half of thy house, I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord. So he's saying, this is what God commanded. This is what God charged him. Listen, he says, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. Right? This man of God had a mission. He says, I want you to enter the city. I don't want you to stay. I don't want you to hang out. I don't want you eating with these people. And I don't want you to turn back. I don't want you to go back to the world the way that you're coming through. I want you to keep moving forward. Right? Yeah. Not to turn around was the final commandment that God charged him with. Look what he says in verse 10. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, there dwelt an old IFB prophet. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. There, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Them they told also their father. My question is, why isn't this old prophet the one going and preaching to the king? Why aren't his sons the ones standing up and preaching to the king? Because this guy's a failure. This guy's a loser. He's living in the city, surrounded by sin. They're in the world. They're doing things the old way, the ways that don't work. You know, we had a church that we helped do a, a soul winning event with. And they're on fire. They want to do soul winning. And a lot of the people that would come up from Orlando to our church started going to this church. And they're getting excited. This church wants to have its own, so we're going to, we're going to do soul winning. Well, things started to change. Then the pastor sees a, a sermon by Pastor Anderson on Freemasonry. And I said, well, I can't support hate. On Freemasonry? That's the sermon you're going to pick to complain about? I thought, well, this is a big red flag. When I met the guy, there was a big red flag already. And then here we are a few months later, and the people are coming up saying, well, there's a lot of us in this church now, and we're encouraging each other, but the pastor is refusing to let us go soul win now. He wants us to do a, a three-tiered approach. First, we're going to just flyer the door. Next week, we might knock the door, but we're not going to preach the gospel. We're not allowed. We have to invite them in to the church. Because the pastor is saying, well, soul winning just isn't working. We're not seeing a bunch of visitors. We don't have a bunch of new numbers. So obviously, soul winning isn't working. Wow. This is the old mentality. This is that old prophet mentality. Right. And it's a loser mentality. Yeah. So why don't we just get a bus and give out free candy you know, have balloons, but we won't preach the gospel. Maybe if they come in the third time, then maybe we'll find out if they're going to heaven or hell. Man, that is wicked. God's not going to bless that. God will not bless that. Look at verse number 14. And went after the man of God and found him under the oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Now, notice God told him to go. But here we find the guy resting. Now look, sometimes in the Christian life, 
we need a little bit of a break, right? Well, man, I've been doing three to thrive, and I'm just starting to get wore out. I'm just going to take a week or two off. Wrong answer, right? Hey, I'm doing three to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm getting wore out. Preaching night, so winning on Saturdays. Hey, maybe trim back a little bit, right? If you come a long distance and Wednesday night's too rough for you, you know, don't forsake the fellowship over one service, right? If Saturday morning soul winning just makes it to where it ruins the rest of your week, don't forsake everything because of one thing. You can find ways to trim up your life and, and prioritize your time because you can't forsake your family. You have priorities. You can't forsake your commandment to preach. Figure out your own time and figure out where to balance it out. But don't just stop. This guy here, he's taking the right path. He's in the right direction and he stops. And what happens? The old IFB comes in and gets him. Oh, I see you're sitting on your butt. Perfect. Right? Look what happens here. Look at verse 15. He said, Then said him unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread or drink water with thee in this place. For it was said unto me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water here, nor turn again, right to your worldliness, nor go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Oh, I see you guys are doing this big work for soul winning and preaching the gospel, but no, no, come over to my church. Try it my way. We're going to pass out flyers. We're going to give out candy. We're going to tickle their ears. We can't afford to preach the gospel. Listen, the devil is setting traps. The devil is going to cause you to doubt the things that you should be standing on. Amen. We're all going to have moments where we go through a, a dry season. It's like ch church is boring. What, I mean, Pastor Mary will preach it. Never mind, I won't say that. <laughs> church gets old. Church wears on you. Soul winning can wear you out, especially if you're not seeing people saved every week. You begin to doubt yourself. Well, I have none this week, none last week. I mean, you know, Lord, is it me? What's going on? And listen, it's good to, to chart your progress because over time, you know, you can see that you're going up, but there's going to be times where you dip down. There's going to be times because you're in the battle where the devil is shooting fiery darts at you and he's going to try to cause you to doubt the things that you should be sure on. Right. Yeah. And those are times that you need encouragement from other people. Those are times that you need to draw closer to the Lord. When you cause yourself doubting something, when you feel like, man, am I really supposed to? You know what? I'm just going to read the Word of God right now. I'm going to stop and get some spiritual bread. I'm going to grow spiritually right now. Listen, you have to train yourself to prepare for these moments because it's going to happen to everybody. This guy lies to him. Turn back. I'm a prophet also, right? Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be accursed, Amen. right? Amen. You run into some Calvinist. Well, no, you know, let me show you something. Calvinism really is true. Hey, let that guy be accursed. Amen. Don't let him cause you to doubt. Don't listen to these false old prophets that refuse to go soul winning. Look what he says in verse 19. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat on the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. He says, Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. He's saying, You're going to die tonight. You're a dead man. It's over. You've messed up. You're a failure. You're done. The one thing God said not to do, the three things, if you will, He did them all. He turned around. He went back. He sat down and he had some food. He's drinking. He's hanging out with a false prophet. Oh, you're a Christian too? But your Calvinist will tell me. Explain. No, fight that doctrine. Amen. Stand up Amen. against these false yeah. prophets. Don't be afraid of them. Amen. He went back to the world. Think about that, Christian. When you begin to head back, well, you know, just one drink. Just a little. I'm just going to watch half an hour. Woe. Woe unto you. You're going back. Look at verse 23. And after it came to pass... I'm sorry, and it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk. Notice he took his time. You're sitting at a table with the guy that just lied to you. You're sitting there eating. He probably had food in his mouth. And then all of a sudden the word of the Lord comes. 
right? And he yells at the guy and says, you're a dead man. What you, he, okay. I guess I'm going to die tonight. I'm going to keep eating. What, do you want to die with a full belly? He's already turned around back to the world. Well, I'm already in it. I might as well keep going. Well, I mean, I'm already back in my sin. I'm hanging out with my old friends. I'm back in the old ways. Might as well sin unto death. Might as well wait and just see. If I, I mean, if judgment is coming, I'll just hang out until it gets here. What a stupid mentality. Yeah. Listen, yeah, we need to keep a short account with God. We need to recognize the sin in our life. We need to correct it immediately. Amen. We need to let the Word of God rebuke us when we're doing wrong. Right. The Holy Amen. Spirit is going to bring these things to your remembrance, and it's up to you what you do with it. It's up to you. When the Word of God comes to you, how do you respond? You just shake your head and keep eating? Well, I guess I'll die with a full belly. No. What a wicked mentality. What a loser mentality. Good. Look at the rest of the story. Look what happened to this guy. He says, It came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled him the ass to wit, the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. Think about what a sight this is. What a sight. You got a donkey and a lion standing there over a dead guy. And everybody knows who that guy was. That's that prophet that said he wasn't going to stay. But now here he is. He's dead. What an example some Christians are, I think, for us. When you see a fellow believer turn back into the world and that roaring lion of the devil slays them, destroys their life, destroys their family, and it's just sitting there in ruins, we need to take heed. We need to pay attention and learn and say, whoa, I see what's just happened. I've seen things play out. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy, hey, where'd that prophet go? I don't know. He kept walking, right? Oh, his carcass is right there. The lion got him. The devil got him. He got him to turn around. He's dead. Don't let that be you. Look at verse 25. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spake by him. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. This man of God was a loser. He failed to finish his course. He didn't fight a good fight. He, he started off well, and then he failed. He failed to be all in. He started. He did some good things. He's got some rewards in heaven. But he goes down in history as the guy that we're not even going to mention his name. How sad is that? I mean, how bad is that when your name becomes a byword? And listen, it started because he stopped. It started because he took a little rest instead of being steadfast. Don't turn back. Don't disobey God. Be steadfast in your faithfulness. Don't be a failure of the faith. Next guy we're going to look at is Lot. Lot was a loser. Yeah. Lot was a total loser. In 2 Peter 2 it says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should after live ungodly. God says, These people, I destroyed them as an example. He says, And delivered just Lot. Just, meaning he's justified. He's saved. He says, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You understand that Lot willfully put himself in the situation that vexed his own soul. He vexed his own soul because of where he was. Because of who he was around, he decided he could live in the world and still be a Christian. And he destroyed his family. And you think, I mean, do you live in the wrong place? Are you in the wrong place in your life? You know, I have a friend in, in, in Jacksonville, and he was telling me, I've got a great neighborhood, we've got all these great amenities, there's a club down here, we got everything. But you know, the problem is, every time I go down there, all they want to do is drink. All they want to do is drink and party and curse and golf. And I don't care for any of that. Yeah. Hey, golfing can be fun, but if you're surrounded by a bunch of drunkards, forget about it. Amen. Go somewhere Amen. else. That's a bad investment. Oh, man, I'm in a bad neighborhood. Yeah, yeah but it's a, it's a big, nice neighborhood. Yeah, it's a bad neighborhood. Right. It's right. full of wickedness and fornication and adultery and drunkenness and drug use. Right. 
The people that are in there, I mean, their children are going to the world. Their children are literally serving the devil. Yeah, that's, right. that's not a good neighborhood. Yeah. You can't just judge by appearance. You know, maybe maybe you live in an apartment, but they've got that pool. And every time you drive by it, there's some whoredoms going on there. Listen, single men, stay away from that stuff. Amen. Hey, Amen. married men, stay away. Hey, married ladies, stay away from that filthiness. Yeah. Use some judgment and don't put yourself in the world's whoredoms. You Amen. will destroy your family. Amen. Are you in the wrong city, maybe? Maybe you're in the wrong church. I know there's a lot of people that have changed cities to get in a good church. And God blesses that. That doesn't mean that everything's cupcakes moving forward, right? <laughs> Brother Nick was telling me, you told me that now I'm in the fight. Things are going to change. I'm going to have attacks. And it's true. It happens to everybody. It may, see, it may begin to move well. God may open doors. But there's going to be times of tribulation for everybody that tries to get in God's will. Amen. Can I get some more water? You're in Genesis chapter 19. Look at verse number 1. It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, Lot's in Sodom. Lot's in the worst city we read about in the Bible. But we know that he's saved. Why didn't he leave? Why was he still here? Well, mate, my, he got that great job. You don't understand. I mean, this job, if I leave it, I'm going to... No. Why didn't you leave? Well, Lot was a good businessman. He had all these herds and flocks and servants, right? I mean, and, and it was his business was successful there. He had to be there. His life was perfect there, right? But he was vexing his own soul. Lot, well, I mean, Lot had all this authority in the city. I mean, he's sitting in the gate, right? He's, he's obviously, you know, a, a man of power and influence in, in Sodom. If he's sitting in the gate... Why should he leave that? Right? He's a, a big fish in a little pond. But listen, Christian, you have a price. You have a price on your head. The devil knows what it is. And he's going to dangle it in front of you. For Sodom, it was success. All he had to do, he could get Lot into Sodom if he showed him enough success. If his business was good enough, he could get Lot to forsake everything else that he was commanded to do. In, in Matthew 11, Jesus said, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Hey, there were miracles done. Jesus preached there. Man of God preached there in Capernaum. Who was preaching in Sodom? No one. Whose job was it to preach there? Lot's job. Lot couldn't even preserve a dozen souls. He couldn't even preserve his own family. There were, I mean, just preach a little. Just open your mouth. But no, he went along with it for business sake. Turn back to Genesis 18. Keep your finger there in Genesis 19. Look at Genesis 18. Look at verse number 17. We'll look at the opposite of it. Genesis 18, 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. You hear, Abraham is going to command his children. Right? Abraham, hey, Abraham is, a, is a homeschooler. Abraham says, the servants in my house, the children in my house, I'm going to command them. They're going to fear the Lord. They're going to hear the commandment of the Lord. There's no blood on Abraham's hands. He was leading by example. He was preaching as he ought to. He was a soul winner. He was getting his servants saved. He was doing the righteous thing. Look at verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. Now turn back to Genesis 19. So here we have Abraham. He's not a failure of the faith. He's like a father of the faith. Abraham set the standard. He said, I am going to teach my children. I am commanded to teach them. I'm going to make sure they know the Lord. I'm going to make sure they're afraid of breaking God's law. That's your responsibility. Every one of you, every one of you in here has that responsibility to fear the Lord. 
to fear his judgment, to fear breaking his commandment. Abraham was leading by example. He was a great man of God. But Lot, Lot's a failure. Look what he did. Look at verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto them, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So here's the city he lives in. The bunch of perverts, the sodomizers. Hey, bring those guys. Hey, we want to look. I mean, they're perverts. Look, look what he does. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after them. Now notice, Lot's operating in subtlety. He's trying to, oh, he's trying to sneak outside real quick. Hey, guys. But look, <laughs> look, it's a little too late, Lot. They're, they've come in a riot to destroy the place. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Was he standing up and preaching the word of God? No. No, he didn't do it then. Why would he do it now? Listen, these people that think, well, during the tribulation, that's when I'll become a great soul winner. If you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it then. Yeah. Yeah. Lot sneaks out the door. Oh, hey, guys, please don't do this wicked thing. What a stinking loser. Yeah. He's lame. He's weak. He has no spine. And he goes down in history as probably the worst Christian in the whole Bible. Surrounded himself with people that were vexing his soul. That was his choice. Why? Because the devil put a carrot in front of his nose. And what was it worth to him? Everything. It was too late. He was a wimp. And he's begging them. Oh, hey, please, guys. Please, please. No. Stand up to these perverts. Look what he says in verse 8. Behold now. I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Lot says, oh, you got a public school? Oh, here you go. Have the rest of my children. Right? The rest of his family was already messed up. He literally says, take my daughters and do whatever you think is right. While well, he's trying to say what you're doing is not right. Can you imagine? Lot did not love his family. Yeah. Lot did not love his family. Yeah. And that's, hey, that's the public school mentality. Yeah. When you get home, watch TV, get up early, get on the bus. I don't want to see your face. I've got my little puppy dog, but, but the kids I can't stand. They go off to school for eight hours. They listen to the world. They do whatever the world tells them is acceptable. And when, they, when they're knocked up and they're on drugs and you wonder what went wrong, it's because parents would not command them as God said so. Amen. Abraham set the example. He set the standard. He commanded his own family. He took responsibility. He wasn't lazy about it. And many Christians today, they'd rather watch TV than command their children. Amen. And then, hey, maybe one day they'll see their kids on TV. Right? They'll see him on Cops. They'll see him on one of these yeah. teen pregnant shows, you know? Yeah. It's wicked. Look what he says. Bring them out to you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. He threw his kids to the dogs. That is sad. I mean, why, why, and you think about it. Abraham was warned about the cry of the innocent. Well, why wasn't Lot doing anything about it? Well, if he won't help his own children, why would he help somebody else's children? Yeah. Yeah. Right? right? The cry of the innocent was great before God. The Bible says a just man falls seven times and rises up again. Lot had an opportunity to rise up, to overcome, but he was lazy. He was selfish. He was a loser. He wouldn't even help the innocent. Look at verse number nine. The angels step in, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Oh, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Hey, that's right, and he will, right? Oh, you can't judge my lifestyle. Yes, I can. The Bible already has. Yeah. It's not Amen. my opinion. It's the fact. It's what God said. It's Amen. true, and I'm not ashamed of it. Amen. I don't care if it offends you. I don't care if it hurts your feelings. You need to know what God has said, and if you Amen. reject it, there is a punishment. He says he will need to be a judge, and now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. They literally give him a death threat. We were going to hurt those two guys. Now we're going to kill you. These molesters are literally saying, we're going to hurt you to death. I mean, just, just wickedness that's going on. Right, yeah. And Lot vexed his own soul because he refused to stand up and speak the truth. Because he refused to get out of his worldly lifestyle. Hey, he had all the pleasures of sin for a season. Yeah. And then judgment comes knocking. And it was too late for Lot. He was already a loser. He was a loser his whole life, and it was too late to stand up when it mattered. Don't be a Lot Christian. Look, they didn't even take him seriously here. He destroyed his own family. He threw them to the dogs. And if you don't open your mouth, then you fail. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. 
Galatians chapter number 2. Don't fail to preach when it's easy, because then you'll never preach when it's hard. Don't fail to stand up for the Word of God. Don't fail to tell your family why you believe what you believe. Don't fail to tell your, your co-workers what God says. Amen. Oh, but you don't understand, we're not allowed to talk about it at work. God gave you that job. Yeah. Yeah. He'll take it from you if you don't stand up and preach the Word. Right. Amen. He'll give it to somebody else that deserves it. Yeah. He'll give it to somebody yeah. else that's not ashamed. Look, and not all failures are unrecoverable. If you, you know, when you fail, when you fall, don't give up. Get up. Right? A righteous man, a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up. And that's the test. That's really what it's all about. King David was a guy that failed many ways in his life. He was successful in many ways. But he was not content with what the Lord had blessed him with. He looked on another man's wife. He sinned. It destroyed his family. The ripple waves from that one thing continued to come back every year and haunt David and hurt his family. When you sin, it hurts more than just you. He, and his failure was resisting temptation, but he did repent before God. God still let him finish strong. He had an honest heart before God. He didn't have a double heart. He got things right. He was willing to humble himself and recover out of that error. And he was used by God. Another man that was like that with it, that failed but got it right was the Apostle Peter, right? Simon Peter. Everybody knows him for his zeal, but a lot of people know him for his mistakes as well. And he did many great things. And in Matthew 16, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou. Jesus said, Yeah, you got that right. He was bold enough to speak the truth. But what happened? A few verses later, he's like... <laughs> Get away from me, Satan, right? you got a devil in your heart to things you're saying. When Peter said, no, Lord, these things shouldn't happen to you. You shouldn't have to die for us. And he told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Sometimes we, I mean, literally, there's verses in between where, where it's like God saying, bless, you're blessed for what you're saying, for what you know, for what you're doing. And then 10 minutes later, get thee behind me. The devil, because that's the walking in the flesh, walking in the spirit. We have to be vigilant about where we're walking. Now, we know that Peter denied the Lord three times, but he actually became one of the strongest preachers for God. One of the strongest, well-known preachers for God. He was very bold. You're in Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse number 11. We're going to look at another error that he made. It says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And of course, we have influence over people. Look at the next verse. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, inasmuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Remember when Peter said, I go a fishing. And guess what? People followed him. Here he says, oh, I go eat with the Jews. And guess what? People are following him. Consider the influence you have. Look at verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? He was called out to the face in front of everybody. And many people were blessed because of that, because of the willingness to try to get it right publicly. He says in verse 15, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. So Peter receives correction. Peter receives rebuke. He's right to the face. You're wrong. You're preaching confusion. You're making people think they have to work their way to heaven. Now Peter was humble enough to receive it and to, and to correct it and to teach otherwise and make sure that he wasn't causing confusion. And God blessed him for humbling himself. It says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Sometimes we're found wrong. Sometimes we say things that are wrong and we need to just come out and say, I'm sorry. 
I was wrong. Confess your sins, confess your faults, and get past it. And we can learn from Peter how he got back up when he failed. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse number 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him that hath written unto you. Right? Remember, rebuke a wise man and he shall love thee. Right? Sometimes, as friends, we need to correct each other to help each other grow spiritually. Right. Sometimes we need to call each other out on things so that we can grow together, we can love each other and be stronger together. Look, he says in verse 16, referring to Paul, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them the, these things, which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. He's admitting here, Paul preaches Scripture. Paul gives us doctrine straight from God. Hey, and he, he's had to receive that correction of the Scripture. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And this is coming from Peter, a man that has been led away with an error, and he fell, and he got up, He's on the right course again, and he falls again. He's led away by the error. He gets back up. He's telling us all, pay attention, beware, be steadfast, stay on that course. It's very important. Look, he says, what's the last thing he says? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 1. This is the last place we'll go. Acts chapter 1. Again, Peter who was a great failure in a lot of ways, also had great success. Peter was a soul winner. Peter was not a loser. He stayed with the fight, even during the roller coaster ride, the ups and the downs. He stuck it out. He toughed it out. And that's the type of Christians that we ought to be. We ought to be steadfast and not fall at somebody else's error, not follow somebody else that's going the wrong way, not hearken to another prophet that's lying to us. I want you to think about this. What's the most, one of the most famous failures in the Bible besides Peter, I think, is, is doubting Thomas. I mean, everybody knows him as doubting Thomas. I mean, who wants a name like that? You know what I mean? I mean, we're supposed to have faith, and you're called doubting Thomas. That's kind of lame. But in John 11, it says other things about him. It says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Right? So in John 11, he's bold. He's saying, let's go, we'll die too. Let's follow Christ, let's do this. Right? He had some boldness to him. But nobody calls him bold Thomas, do they? You know, ready to die, Thomas. No, they call him doubting Thomas. It was a few chapters later, John 20 says, Except I see in his hands and the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And of course, when Jesus saw him, he rebuked him. He said, hey, be not faithless, but believing. It takes some faith. It takes some faithfulness. Now look, you're in Acts chapter 1, verse number 13. And this, I don't think that we should call him Doubting Thomas. Amen. Look at verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. Hey, he made the cut. He stayed there. Look at the next verse. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with her brethren. He stayed faithful. He recovered from his error. You should call him bold Thomas, Amen. right? You should call him continuing Thomas, faithful Thomas, because he's there. He's continuing. He's still with them. He's been through it all, and he's still fighting for God. And that's the type of Christian we ought to be. Let it not be known, let it not go down in history that you're a failure of the faith. Well, I believe, but I've got my TV show. I've got my job. I've, you don't know, I, I mean, I've got this car note. I've got to take care of that first. Let those things pass away, Amen. right? Amen. Be willing to stand on the truth and give up everything in this world to fight for Jesus. 
Amen. He will repay you in ways that you can't even describe. Amen. Listen, don't be a loser. Don't give Amen. in to faith. Be bold. Continue. Don't be led away. Don't fall from your steadfastness. This church is known as steadfast for a reason. There's some great men of God here. There's some great families here. I'm encouraged to be here today and just see everybody's growth. And, you know, it's our job to not be a loser. It's our choice to go out and be a winner. Let's go be soul winners. Let's not go down as failures of the faith. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Lord God Almighty, thank you for the families that are here. Lord, thank you for the many ways that you've blessed steadfast. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to stay strong and be willing to sacrifice the things and not turn back into the world. Lord, we don't want to go down in history as a failure or as an unnamed prophet. Lord, I just pray that you would give us more opportunities to preach the gospel and to stand strong on unpopular doctrine. Lord, we love you and we love your word and we ask that you would bless the fellowship afterwards. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.